So a couple questions that were submitted that we did not get to earlier. And uh, as a pastor rearing children at home, how can I best balance my time to meet their needs and that of the ministry? I don't want to neglect my kids. Now, I tied that question into another question earlier, but the gentleman came and said, uh, you missed my question. That's now to ask. He resubmitted it. All right. And it says, hey, idiot moderator. No, it does not say that. <laughs> so, but as a pastor rearing children at home, how do you balance their needs and that of the ministry to not neglect the kids and not neglect the ministry? Do you want to answer first? Or? Okay. Well, um, first of all, let me say that I've not always been very good at that, okay? Especially in the, I've been pastoring Faith Baptist Church in Avon now for 21 years, and the church had some real challenges when I first came, and so the church dominated a lot of my time. We were at that time completely in survival mode uh, in a lot of ways as a congregation, and they had been through a lot of problems, and so uh, early on it took a lot of my time, but one thing that I found was this, you have to draw lines in regard to personal time. And my question a little bit ago was the question about what do you do about your cell phone and texting and, and it interrupts everything you, you planned for the day. And part of, part of what I do now is simply don't respond to anything that is not an emergency if I'm having time with my family or if I'm having time with my wife. And, and what is an emergency? Here's, here's an emergency. Emergency means someone is dying imminently and soon. Okay? Okay, soon means within an hour or two. It does not mean they're on hospice care and have been on hospice care for six months. Come visit them. It means it's, it's very imminent. I've been done many a visit where someone thought it was going to happen soon. I had one guy over a year ago. I was summoned to the bedside and uh, told he was going to die within moments. And uh, two weeks ago, he was in church on <laughs> Sunday. And uh, this guy just will not die, okay, because... because um, <laughs> Be because frankly he's a very kind of a mean person okay and the mean mean tend to live longer and so so he won't die but then uh, then the second thing the second thing is this uh, if there's any suggestion on the part of someone that they're suicidal okay that those two things either death or uh, threatened suicide those would interrupt but other than that um, I try to schedule things as best as I can within hours and within office time another thing I would say is this people want counseling because their life is falling apart but they won't do it during times where it inconveniences them. And this, this gentleman is a problem. And so I've trained our people that I do counseling um, after the Wednesday night service. I'll do counseling anytime during the regular business hours during the day. But I'm not going to set up an ongoing marriage counseling appointment for Thursday night because that's my family time. So those are a couple things that I do. Pastor, how about you? Because you obviously had a, had a pretty hefty travel schedule. And yes, your kids sure love you a lot. And I agree with Dr. Armani that people are very rude in the way they schedule their deaths. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's always inconvenient. Always inconvenient. That's why I wasn't here last night. It's inconvenient. I had a funeral. Uh, I did travel a lot. My children came. Our children came a little later in our marriage. Chris was born when we'd been married 10 years. And Katie, when we'd been married 15. <clears throat> so I was gone just about every Monday and Tuesday, much of their growing up years. So a few things we did. Number one, we did not make a distinction between family time and God. Some people think family time is sitting around watching some movie while watching their own phones. And that's their family night. Why isn't family time going soul winning together? Why isn't family time working on a bus route together? We took our kids soul winning while well, they're still little and in the carriers. You know, it's a really great thing to do. People are much nicer to you. You look pretty inoffensive when you walk up there with a baby. And our girls grew up loving going out soul winning. Katie would say to his little girl, Dad, can I give them the good news? By that she meant, can I hand them the tract? And so that was a big deal to be able to do that. My dad did that. My dad ran the Detroit Rescue Mission. My dad would be gone six weeks at a time traveling. He went into evangelism after he left the mission. I never felt neglected. I never felt like he didn't love me. He was always good to me, always counseled me. He'd write me letters while he was gone. He always gave me, the greatest gift my dad gave me was security. He just loved me. If I had faults, he still loved me. He'd straighten me out, but he didn't ever make me think I had to do something for him to love me. So one thing we did was take them in ministry together. If I was preaching somewhere, we could take them. We did. We've been a lot of times preaching. And some nice people put us in a cabin on the lake. And sometimes people got us a nice motel room. And the kids could do fun things there. 
Another thing that we did was have big family vacations every year. We'd take, I, I never took two Sundays, but I'd take a Monday to the next two Fridays later, or even the next Saturday, and we'd go to Disney. And we'd go to Universal. And uh, that's not my favorite vacation. I still like those places. But my favorite vacation is sitting on a beach with the sun shining and the waves lapping, reading a book in a nice chair. That's my favorite vacation. But that's, that wasn't best for the girls. So we tried to make big memories for them. And I'd save up my miles to buy the tickets. And I'd say, do you know why we get to do this? And after all, they'd say, because daddy's a preacher. One time I had an opportunity to preach at my first Sword of the Lord conference. It was in Durham, North Carolina. But it was on Carissa's birthday. She was in about the second grade. I said, sweetie, this man wants me to preach for him. I'd miss your birthday. We'd celebrate your birthday another day. But I said, I don't have to go. I haven't told him won't go. I will go. I won't go if you don't want me to. I said, if I do go, I'll give you $20. She said, you're going. <laughs> So I took to giving my daughter's money every time I was away overnight. And that took some of the sting out of it. I also took uh, 10% of any love offerings I got when I traveled while I was pastoring and gave them to my wife. And that, that helped with that. So those are some things we did. There are times you have to drop everything else and deal with your family. There are times your family needs to see that the work of God is so important that you're going to focus on it for a while. And priorities shift but you always want to make sure they know they're loved. Another thing I always try to do is be accessible. Before cell phones, I had a private line into my office. My wife, my daughters, and a few close friends had the number. And they did not go through the secretary. They could call straight into my office. I like that I'm that that ten percent idea to give that to your wife, Doctor Let. That's that's a great idea. I'm glad that my wife cannot be with me on this trip. That's <laughs> well. Pastor Jackson gave 100% to his wife. And of course, his wife's my wife's sister. And when my wife suggested that he was doing that, she said, what do you think about it? I said, I think that's really nice of Doug. <laughs> Should a pastor move to another church after handing over a church to a new pastor? <laughs> this wasn't my question either. I guess you'll have to answer that one. <laughs> Okay, I thought you were talking about the pastor resigned and someone else came in, and I'd say only if the guy who resigned has a job, he has to go to another church if he needs a job. But no, I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I don't think that's necessary in, in some cases, but I think it's, and Pastor Willette can really speak to this because they're, they're in the midst of this. Um, you know, I have two thoughts about that. I would like to, uh, when I ha pass the church off to someone else, I would like to remain in the congregation strictly to be a thorn in the side to the new guy, okay? And uh, there's, the, there's the evil side, but in reality, I think, that, uh, I think that it's fine as long as the pastor, the former pastor, handles that well. And so, Dr. Willett, why don't you explain how to handle that well? You have to have the right relationship. Uh, if we had a very gradual transition, it took four years almost from the time I spoke to Brother Howell until the time I left. So people had plenty of time to get used to it. But the Howell's like a son to me, and I'm like a great grandfather to him. <laughs> I understand that. And and uh, I love him. I did everything I could think of to make it good for him. Uh, everything we, we were out of debt. We had money in the bank, more money than we'd ever had. Now, one of the things I did was deliberately left some things undone so he could come in and be the hero. I'm, I don't like details. I don't like meetings. We hadn't had a Sunday school meeting, teachers meeting in probably five or six years when I left. And uh, so Brother Howell, I said, you, I told him, I said, you can do that, organize that. People will love it. They'll be happy. But he's very kind and very wise. And somebody said, good. Now we have a Sunday school teachers meeting. He said, no, not for a while. He was going to come right in and say, okay, now we're going to fix this. He, I don't know if he's had one yet, but he said he wouldn't have one until fall sometime. So it depends. I'm really happy. I love this church. And I love the people here. And I spent 44 years as the pastor. And I saw God do amazing things. And I don't have any sense that if Brother Howell, Howell succeeds, that means he is somehow a success and I'm a failure. If he doesn't succeed, I'm probably a failure. If, if the Lord used me to build the right kind of people and the right kind of foundation, he should be able to go forward. And by the way, he's doing a fabulous job. Offerings in July were $1,000 a week above budget. That never happened when I was the pastor. A lot of new people in the church, some of them were at the lunch today. And a lot of people that are being reached do a lot of wonderful things. And so if you do it right, it ought to go forward. 
there may be a little lull there wasn't here, but, but I'm really glad I get to stay. But it depends on your situation. But if you're going to stay, you only support your pastor and you don't say anything about anything you disagree with. Pastor Howell said to me, if you ever see me doing anything you don't think I, I should do, please tell me. And I said, I probably won't. You'll have to ask me. And I said, unless it's really, really bad, I'm not going to say anything. Now, I'll let him know about things that are going on that somebody told me. And somebody says this to me, I'll say, well, I'll, I'll mention it to pastor. I'll give him information. When I was pastoring, I said, I don't want to be omnipotent, but I want to be omniscient. I want to know everything. So, if, if, But I didn't tell him what to do. I just, you may want to know this. Here's what happened. And he would decide what to do about it. I think it's, if it's the right relationship, you ought to be able to stay. But realize you're not the pastor. You're just a member. I have no more right than any other member. I don't know if this happened or not, but Brother Howell had an unexpected expense a little bit ago, and I spoke to one of the key deacons, and I said, I'm only speaking as a member, but I would feel happy if our church were able to help Pastor Howell with that expense. And he, I texted him, and he texted me back a thumbs up. Whether he did anything, I don't know. I have that right as a member to make a suggestion, but I don't have any right to tell anybody what to do. I do appreciate that the new Porsche drives excellent. Good. <laughs> just, just not that I have any sense to weigh in or any, anything, to, but I love having Pastor around. I'm fighting to get him here more. And uh, I was not the guy who needed to cannibalize my predecessor's memory yeah. to build anything. I love him here. And, and I did tell him, though, I, didn't want, I would not let him cannibalize his ministry because he would do that to, to push me up. And I love having him around. He didn't tell you the rest of that conversation, though, about him telling me if I was doing something wrong unless I would ask him. He did tell that part. And I did. I think I said, Pastor, that day, I believe I am. He did say that. <laughs> because I, I value his, for me, his wisdom. One last question, and we have to move on. Um, how do you, can you describe a relationship between the pastor and assistant pastors, specifically, specifically, though, how it works if the senior pastor is younger than an assistant pastor? Okay, I actually have that um, situation on my staff, but the older man who takes care of our, we call him the pastor of in-reach, not outreach, but in-reach, and he takes care of our senior saints ministry. Uh, he was trained under a, a very, um, for lack of a better word, a very draconian pastor who, for whom he worked for several decades. And he finds a lot more freedom at faith, but he can be trusted with freedom because uh, he is an incredibly disciplined individual. So then apart from him, the rest of my staff, they are younger and they need the mentoring and the training, and I find especially in relationships, okay, so the younger men want to have a relationship. Now, that to me is a strength of mine because I'm extremely relational to a fault, and so they enjoy that relationship, and it, it, it provides me a platform to work with them, but that does not work for every pastor, okay? A lot of this has to do with uh, personalities, both of the pastor's personality and then the personality of his staff. And every once in a while, uh, we, we try very hard not to hire anyone that will not mesh well with the entire yeah. personality of the staff. That's really an important thing because disunity on the staff, you can, you can ruin your church that way. But, uh, you know, I work well with that older pastor and I went into his office about three days ago and I just sat down in his office and I said, Pastor, Pastor Morris, I said, you saved my bacon. You saved my bacon. He said, what do you mean, preacher? I said, well, we've got a lot of older people in the church. They need a lot of attention. There's no way I could give them that attention. And I said to him, you've saved my bacon because they accept your attention as a, as a you know, supplement for mine, for my ability to do the same thing. So I, tr I treat him with utmost respect. He has degrees in counseling. And when I have a problem or a question or just a need, I sit down in his office. I have no problem doing that and talking to him. So, you know, Timothy was to treat the older men as fathers, okay? And that, I think that applies in the area of the church staff. I think you respect their age, but it still doesn't change the fact you're the pastor and they're the right. assistant. Uh, most of my mentoring was done in staff meetings. Something would be said that would make me think of something and I would, I would call it philosophize a little mm -hmm. while. Well, here's why we do this. Here's why we don't do that. Here's what to watch out for. Here's this area of fundamentalism that's going a different direction. Be careful about it. And that was, I, I like Prov or Deuteronomy 6 says you teach them by the way. Another thing that I did, I'd say to our guys, if you have any questions, ask me. Now, I've, I've got people I said two or three times, ask me if you've got any questions. They never asked me anything. So I never told them anything. And I never beat assistant pastors over the head. I would say to them, if you, you know you're in trouble two ways as an assistant. One, if I start doing your job. And I did sometimes. 
If I start doing your job, I don't need you. I had a music director, didn't do a Sunday school program, come up last minute, tried to get a bunch of other people to do his work for him. I said, man, you can't do that. So I got some people in and I put a Sunday school program together. And he's very wise. I didn't say anything to him. But a few weeks later, he came in and said, what should I do so that you don't have to do my job? Second time you know you're in trouble when I was pastoring and your assistant is if I stop talking to you. I don't mean say hi or be kind, but stop trying to mentor you, teach you, give you. Because if you resist what I have to give you, I'm not going to give you anymore. That's right. I, I got enough people that will listen to what I say. I'm not going to fight with anybody who won't listen to it. Right. Now, there's other ways of doing it. That was, just, that was just my way. So you had to want it. You had to ask for it. Scott Cowling is transformed from the person he was when we hired him. And the incident that started it, he can give you more detail than this, but what I remember, he asked me a question, I gave him an answer, and he argued with the answer. And after a little bit, I said, Brother Colin, I can't help you. You ask my advice, I give it to you, you argue with it. I can't help you. I'm not going to fight him. And so he left, came back 20 minutes later and said, okay, what do I need to do so you can help me? And began then giving me tremendous permission to invest in his life and to speak to all kind of little things. Uh, so... I, I just, I don't like to force it on anybody. If you don't want it, I'll give it to somebody who does. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. If I could have that handheld, Brother Monty. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Monty, appreciate that. And that, to, to uh, go off of Pastor Lett, that style, that answer, is exactly how he talked to us for 17 years. And he's that same, same graciousness and same wisdom. Um,